Okay, so two questions, uh, which, which I'm gonna do is two parts, and you'll notice the ever so subtle cha change in the slides here. Um, first of all, in terms of quantum, you know, we've been talking about it for quite a while. And the first thing I wanna tell you is that the future for quantum is not what you think it's going to be. Uh, the future for quantum is not what we thought was gonna be six months ago, or a year ago, or two years ago. Many things have changed. Um, and what I would also, um, my wife is a historian, is that the, 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 past, the past is also not what you really thought it was. Uh, so here, evidently, we have a font problem. Um, so what, what I will say is that this is an MRI machine, nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a quantum process. These became popular in the 1970s and the 1980s, and the research for this goes back to about the 1940s. Felix Bloch, who many of you have heard of the Bloch sphere, you've learned a little bit, was a physicist and he pioneered a lot of this work. So not only is this about 40 years old and a very practical use of quantum today, the technology is, is in fact much older. Um, all right, so we're gonna see next. All right, fonts are good. Um, and in fact, quantum does not equal quantum computing. Right? When we first started talking a lot about quantum computing six or seven years ago, when we got beyond the theoretical stage, you know, yeah, we, we, we'd shortcut it, quantum, quantum, quantum. Everybody knows what quantum computing. Um, but you know, quantum computing is taking a while. And quantum computing, we said would take a while. Sometimes I think it's like that child in the back seat, you're going on a vacation, right? And you say, this is going to take three hours, right? You're gonna sit there in the car. And after 15 minutes, the kid says, are we there yet, right? And, and suddenly it's the vacation winter or something like that, right? And we said, no, it's only been 15 minutes. We said it would take three hours. And the kid says, but I wanna be there. I'm getting bored, right? And sometimes there's a little bit of, of that with, with quantum computing, but it's because, look, there is a very long way from the ever improving, very small number of qubits we have today in the grand scheme of things, to these wonderful future applications of optimization and machine learning, and certainly like pharmaceutical things, like years and, and years away. And so what's really important for us all is to understand, well, what happens in the middle? And that's gonna be part two, which is you know, the barriers to, to actually getting there. But part one of this is to say, there's a lot going on with quantum. So not only NMR, right, which has been medical for a very long time, but things like PNT, positioning, navigation, and timing. Um, we as a society are obsessed and utterly dependent on time, right? We think of GPS as getting us to our kid's school or the pizza place or wherever we, we need to go. But almost even more than that, GPS is a time server. When you go to an ATM and it prints out what time you took out that money, um, that probably came from a satellite, GPS satellite. Yet they're horribly inaccurate. They have to be updated twice a day in terms of times. They have atomic clocks, but not great atomic clocks and things like this. And time is really at the center of so much of what we do, including the internet, including networks and things like this. Um, GPS is, is, is getting denied left and right. We'll see an example of this in, in, in a moment. So at the heart of a lot of what quantum will be is future navigation, future sensors, um, in, enhancing the security. And we've had lots of discussions about security and frankly, beyond the actual quantum techniques, I think a lot of that is just a cybersecurity discussion. Um, if you have bad cybersecurity, quantum or not, you're in trouble. Right? You know, we don't have to talk about quantum here. But in terms of the speed, the quality, increasing the bandwidth, the quality of networks, both data as well as energy networks. You know, when, when I was little <laughs> in New York, we knew where our energy came from, right? It, it came from probably Niagara Falls, right? The, the big waterfalls and, and things like that. Now, of course, we have many different ways of generating energy, including people's houses, their backyards, all sorts of things. Energy is coming in and out. It has to be synchronized extremely carefully. Uh, and of course, th there are some security concerns. Um, with all of this, as we talk about quantum, everything, software is gonna be paramount. So for all our love of hardware in this phase, 
of what we're talking about. Show me my shiny new processor, right? It is software that makes the day, right? How many smartphones are there? Well, there are actually not that many. How many apps are there? Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. So we are going to be transitioning into a part where software will make or break the future of quantum. That's not just quantum computing, it's the other applications as well. Um, I work now, after many years at IBM, I work for Inflection. Uh, it's a small company based in Colorado, uh, though with offices in Oxford, Australia, and, and a few other places. It is not a startup. It's been around since 2007. Um, a lot of the income through the years has been working with governments and, and others, um, though we did close a Series B, 110 million US dollars in, in November. Uh, and we're proceeding along. And so in terms of the business opportunities, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do. And so following on from that story of, uh, of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, first of all, um, starting on the far right, we build the little things that none of you ever look at in the basis of a lot of quantum computers, not superconducting, but the photonic devices, the glass cells where the atoms and the ions are held. We build many of those. It's photonics. Photonics is huge. For as much as we see the cryostats and whatever, photonics is at the core of the future quantum infrastructure. And without good growth of photonics industry, driving down the cost and the size into, for example, photonics integrated circuits. None of this stuff is gonna work beyond toy size machines that are disconnected from each other, all right? So that's the first lesson. So we, we make many of these components. Uh, they pop up in the weirdest places, shall I say. Um, quantum atomic clocks, uh, we, we currently are, uh, we have announced a new line with that. Quantum radio frequency receivers, RF, antennas, quantum, right? So here's one thing with quantum. Quantum is as good as we're going to get at measuring things. It's the highest resolution we're going to get. There is nothing following quantum that will be better for medical imaging, for receiving radio, for measuring time, this is the last shot we get. Now we may improve the methods, we may make them smaller, but this is why quantum is important. And to be blunt, we can't screw it up, <laughs> right? This is why there's so much national attention on, on what we are doing. Uh, quantum inertial sensors, measuring gravity, uh, measuring velocity, gyroscopes, things like this. All right, maybe now the military is starting to get interested. And in fact, many defense organizations around the world are extremely interested in this part of the quantum sensor <laughs> world. And then we start moving up into the system level. Uh, quantum computers and the software that optimizes on top of this. Without optimizing compilers, our quantum computers will be pathetically slow. Just the way it's going to work, right? Uh, People can write very slow code, <laughs> right? But also quantum computers are complicated. There's an understatement, right? Um, we're going to need software technology. And then, of course, what, what we do uh, with, with partners. Um, we have actually been around a little while, up on the International Space Station. Uh, the the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the United States has something called the Cold Atom Lab, that they do gravity experiments. That's Christine Cook. Uh, she's one of the astronauts selected for the Mariner 2 flyby of the moon. Not Mariner 2, Artemis 2. Um, and she was in charge of the cold atom lab. At its heart is our technology. So this kind of says, well, how robust is your quantum technology? We like to say, can you put it on a rocket and shoot it up into space? Does it still work? But this is going to be required, and this is going to be the environment for a lot of different quantum uh, devices, shall I say, if we use it for mining, detecting resources, and, and so, so forth. Uh, these have to be tough devices, and this happens to be a great example. Now, GPS spoofing, um, or GPS denial. Again, we use GPS, the military uses GPS. We don't always like to talk about military applications, but look, it happens, right? Drones, different things like this, um, various reasons, different players here. These things are driven by GPS satellites. 
There are parts of the world where you cannot land at regular old commercial airports without it being a risk. At different times, Tel Aviv uh, recently hit a six-month high for GPS spoofing. Um, and it wasn't just others doing it. They were all doing it. You know, I spoof you, you spoof me. Right? No one knows where we are. Right? So you need accurate measurements of where we are right, and how far we've gone. This is something about Denver, since uh, the company's based near, near Denver, within a 50-mile radius of the Denver airport. GPS was messed up. So it wasn't just people driving to the airport, right? It was actually the plane, planes landing. All right, so two different markets, as I mentioned, quantum atomic clocks. Um, those will proceed from roughly the size within a couple of years down to a rack, then down to somewhat smaller. And we think probably 10 to 12 years once, if the photonics market keeps up, a little bit, maybe a, a couple of euro size, right? But that's dependent on a lot of other technology. And then quantum radio frequency sensing, which will have a lot of use for mobile um, and, and much better use of, of the spectrum here. OK, so now let's flip over to, the, to part two, which are the uh, problems for ultimately reaching this, this wonderful world, what we have to do. You can't solve these great big problems that we can't do classically with little tiny quantum computers. OK, I mean, that, that's, that's just the case. NISC, non-NISC, right? Error correction, big quantum computer, implied by those words, right? Um, so it's comparing saying, hey, look, I have the best bicycle in the world, right? But what you really need is a high-performance airplane. And this sounds really negative, and maybe I'm insulting. And I'm not, because you know, really, if you look at the science and the engineering of a lot of the providers out there, it's incredible. They're making amazing progress. But it's one step after another. And what I would also say, in terms of airplanes and bicycles, and maybe this is a, a US reference, is that the Wright brothers, right, at least you know, Mer America, planes, they had a bicycle shop before they built airplanes. <laughs> So maybe that's kind of where we are. But bear this in mind in not repeating certain types of hype. All right, so quantum computers, right? Um, I call them CPU cores. Whatever your grouping of, <coughs> excuse me. Good, that wasn't being taped or anything. Um, a CPU core, right? So you have a bunch of qubits. Somehow you're putting your arm around it. Could be a chip, could be a trap could be a neutral atom array or something like this. There are only so many you can fit. Maybe in the future you'll fit more. But you have to start connecting them. You cannot build big enough cores to solve the future problems. So you have to make multiple cores. You have to connect them. You have to have very efficient, right, low error connections between them. And oh, by the way, quantum memory or quantum storage is kind of important. Think of classical computing. Think of your phone with no memory or no storage. Not too useful, right? And in the same way, quantum encoded information has to be in this type of, 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 of memory. All right? Well, we have to start connecting these things. Probably the best bet, unless you're somehow built on, let's say, microwaves, or you're going to do optical. Photonics, once again, is at the core. Depending on your technology, right, you'll do this in different ways, but it's easier or harder to do this. You must be able to connect them. If you cannot connect them, once again, we are screwed <laughs> because we're going to be stuck in the, the world of little or isolated devices that are not enough oomph to really show an, anything significant here. And so now we start saying, all right, well, you have these, the, these cores, and they're grouped into QPUs, and we have to have multiple QPUs. Think of CPUs, right, Ch classical chips. And now you have to start doing this, and I just called it a quantum rack of types of things, you know, the, the model of, of multiple things, but they're close. And then we're going to start uh, connecting them in different ways for security concerns, customer concerns. Um, some will be networked. Some will reach to the outside world. And now we get into quantum networking, and we're not just sending bits. We're transmitting quantum encoded data, in some cases, with entanglement, that weird thing, right? But that must be preserved if we're really shooting it across a network. 
So whereas you might think of a simple quantum computer to quantum computer connection there, in fact, for anything over a very small uh, distance, uh, we're going to have to have like a repeater or a router in between. Hard to do. Uh, and in fact, the future is going to be all these different types of devices connected together. By the way, almost every type of device here, including the quantum computers, will probably need atomic clocks at their core. It's kind of a secret of the way quantum computers really work at the lowest level. They need accurate relative um, time measurement, which this would be. So this is the future, massively networked. If we don't get there, we won't have big enough quantum computers. We won't make good use of the data. Just like every other generation of computing, it finally comes down to it's about the data. It's not about my shiny processor. It's about the data. One thing to, as, I, as I leave to think about, governments are a little concerned about uh, shipping really powerful quantum computers overseas. So there's one thing for me to have one quantum computer, and it's only so powerful. But if I can network them, maybe I can build bigger quantum computers. How is big is too big? A lot, uh, lot of questions. The answer is we don't know. We don't know how to measure it. Um, the answer, though, also tends to be as well, don't do it, <laughs> right, which they tend to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.